Shoshana Chain, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're an author. I am an author. I mean, quietly, I was already an author. We had a little kid, we have a kid's workbook that talks about uh, food literacy, of course, and something that we published ourselves to have to have handouts and things like that. But this is my first traditionally published storybook for children. Um, and it's super, super exciting for me. So let's, uh, for those of us who are listening and, and don't have the, the, uh, the advantage of the YouTube picture of the book behind you, what's, what's the book and what's it so about? Here, I have, a, I have a closer one for those who are watching, but it's called I Am a Peaceful Goldfish. And it's a brightly illustrated picture book for children. I say it's for everyone, right? Zero to 100. Um, but, you know, around that age of zero to three to, to seven years old. And basically what it does is it teaches children how to take that deep breath to go and they could practice it in an imaginative and fun way when they're in good moods, when they're happy, so that when they do have that an unwanted situation come up, they're able to rely on those skills that they've learned previously, use the pictures as cues or just the physical breath as cues. There's so many different ways, depending on what kind of learners these, these children are, to be able to, to use that because, I mean, it, it's a really important skill and when, my son was having a hard time. He was breathing so shallow and he was crying and I couldn't calm him down. I'm saying, take deep breaths, take deep breaths. But we hadn't practiced that when he was happy and in a good mood. So he mm. needed to learn it outside of, outside of that situation. So I guess it's like, like Lamaze, right? Like, you know, they don't start teaching the, the, the lady to breathe right when she's in labor. Exactly. Exactly. It's definitely something you want to learn beforehand, you know, and the, and the same, that's why we train for marathons. That's why we train for triathlons. That's why we, why, why we do what we do, why we always practice is because we're practicing towards a certain goal and, and taking deep breaths in a moment of, of anxiety is a hard thing to do. So you have to have that, that practice in advance for sure. Hmm. What led you to want to write this book? So I guess it kind of goes back when I was in, I, I was a teacher before I was in the health world. And uh, when I was doing my bachelor of education, we had to make the first page of a children's storybook. And I'm like, this is awesome. And I did it and it was really, really difficult. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, but I'll do it again someday. I'll publish a book someday. And then, you know, you get on with life, you get married, you have children, you travel the world and you don't get to all of your goals or, they, or they're not as important goals to you at that time. And then I had taken a kid's yoga course and I was really working on mindfulness and meditation for myself because of my own health, health issues and because of what we had gone through with Adam. And in that moment, when I said my, when my son was taking those shallow breaths, I needed a tool for him. I needed something to teach him. And there was nothing on my bookshelf as a teacher. There was nothing in the library. There was nothing I could find online. So I sat down to write it and I said, my son needs this in this moment. And this would be amazing for other children and teachers and parents to get their hands on down the road. So that started the six year journey of birthing this book. Gotcha. Talk about Lamaze. <laughs> right. Now, you know, there's lots of ways that stress management has been taught to kids right, over the years. I, I know this because in 1998, I got uh, my dissertation was on stress management for kids. And I learned stuff that probably today has been either not quite debunked, but certainly no longer cutting edge or, you know, it was all about, um, you know, thoughts. It was very, very cognitive. Um, what did you, when you said, okay, well, I want to teach mindfulness, what were the traditions? What was the evidence? Like, there's so many ways to go about this. What, and, you know, what, what were the, what were the fundamentals that you understand in terms of human physiology and psychology that you wanted to get across? So it wasn't so much about that in that moment as it was just knowing my son's taking these shallow breaths. He's unable to connect his mind and body. I've been in that situation before. I personally know what those deep breaths do for me. So that's something that I need to teach him. And that's kind of where, you know, that's kind of where it was 
where it was birthed from. And then, you know, as we go, we, we, there, are, there are articles, there are things on PubMed, Google Scholar that are, that are showing that, that taking a deep breath and connecting and through, te through meditation kind of courses, I guess, not really courses, but through meditation programs that I bought to teach myself to meditate. This is something that, that comes up a lot and that definitely, that definitely works. And sometimes things will be debunked and sometimes things will seem passe, but the truth of the matter is if they work for you in that moment, then that's what you need to go with as well. So it's very experience. This is about experience. This is about taking the time to, to connect and realizing that whether it's taking deep breaths or whether it's making positive statements, that there is always something that will be available to help you get out of that situation. I mean, you'll, you'll never get out of the situation that's happening in your life at that moment, but how you react to it. So there's always tools to teach you to, real, to react in a different way, to think, to connect with the body, to choose your words more wisely, to be able to pause and take a moment. Okay. And so what, what made you put it into a sort of a colorful storybook format about a goldfish? So when I first wrote it, what I really wanted to do is find a way to teach, to instruct children to take those deep breaths without it being instructional, without there being an adult saying, okay, class, let's take a deep breath now and let's let it out. So what I tried to do is find objects, whether they were, whether they were animals or whether they were inanimate objects around the house, around their, their life that they can relate to. So we have the goldfish. We, you know, and I think we all, when, when, we, when we're teaching kids to take a deep breath, we take a deep breath in and blow out your candles, take a deep breath in and blow out your candles. Um, so in the original version, there were candles that needed to be blown out, but then there's a, a, there's a, a pinwheel, there's wind chimes, there's all different things that they are exposed to. There's dragons from books. Kids love to imagine and they love to act things out. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to make it fun and imaginative and, and playful. So, and the original pictures that I actually made before, before I decided to traditionally publish the book, they were not quite, they, they were still lots of fun, but they were not quite as colorful and popful. But when you work with your, with your publishing company, they help you research and find the best illustrator for the story. And when I saw Lori Joy Smith's pictures, I knew 100% that she needed to be the illustrator for this book. Oh, what what had she done that you that you liked? So I I was I didn't know her name before, but when I looked at her work, I had seen pictures that I remembered seeing and reading to my students when I was still a teacher. And it's just that it's so simple. There's not a lot of detail in the faces. There's not a lot of de It's not very realistic, but it's something that other children can relate to. And it was really important for me to try to incorporate as many different colors, shapes, and sizes of people in, in the book so that not just my children can open up the pages, not just white children can open up the pages and see themselves in it. So I found that we were able to do that with her work um, in a really fun and interesting way. So of course we could only have two characters throughout the book, um, but then when you open up the front cover and you look inside, you can see that we have a lot of different demographics. And I know not mm. everybody's on YouTube, but there's a lot of different demographics that are represented there. And they're a little bit upset in the on the front cover, but on the back cover, they're a little bit happier and and um, you know they've they've gone through the techniques and they're feeling a little bit happier. So it was a really great way to kind of have more children see themselves in the artwork. Mm, yeah, that's that's such a challenge because I just finished working on a book, a grown-up book about essentially how to, you know, how to change other people's behavior. So sort of basically a coaching book, and we include dialogues. And we were originally going to have cartoons like you know uh, we were modeling it after how to talk so kids will listen and listen so kids will talk and they had these wonderful little cartoons and we realized like every cartoon we made and every person we named in a, uh, was like saying something like well 
you know, is Ben okay as a name? What about Aisha? Like everything had to, you know, you know, we don't have any Asian characters. Well, actually, you know, Sally's Asian, like in my mind, like how, did, did you have to like sort of tread carefully or be very, very thoughtful to, you know, to like we had to, you know, we had one dialogue where somebody's being a bit bossy and we made it a woman and we're like, sec, like, sh is that okay? Like, should it have been, like, you know, like you can go crazy. I understand. We spent hours. So in the, before I decided that I was going to go through and try to find a traditional publisher, I, I hired a local artist to, to illustrate the book. And what I said to her is, can you create me one character where you can't tell where her, where all her family's from, right? So I want it to be a mix of, you know, Caucasian and black and Asian. And, you know, I wanted, I wanted a whole bunch of things mixed in there. And she did a really great, she did a really great job at that. And it was simple, but when I was working with, and, and some of the lessons that I learned working with the, with the publisher is that you need to think these things through because what you put, end up putting on paper, whether you intended it or not, is going to send a message to everybody else. So we did decide like, was it gonna be the older boy or was it gonna be an older girl, right? Is it, is it the girl who's more into mindfulness and therefore boys don't know about this and girls need to, to teach them it? And are we giving into that, um, you know, are we giving into that stereotype? Um, but we didn't wanna just reverse all the stereotypes to not be stereotypical. Right. Um, so there was a lot, there was a lot that went into it is, you know, like what color hair is, is, is the white character going to have? And should, should the color character be older or younger? We thought about all of those things. I mean, there was even originally a page with confetti taking a deep breath in and blowing out the confetti. And we were like, but wait a minute, what is the effect of that on the planet? And what is the effect of that, you know, kind of with, cleanliness and things like that and do we want to encourage people to be blowing confetti all over the place and what if they don't clean it up so these we've thought out a lot a lot of details in this book to make sure that we were setting an example in some ways but also that that we weren't playing into stereotype but again just not reversing it just to not be stereotypical yeah and um, how do you feel about it now? Like, do you think you nailed it? Because I, 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 I feel like our book, I have no idea, you know? I guess, I guess I felt like we had nailed it, but I was a little bit cautious about it too. And um, as the reviews started coming in from some of the big children's reviewers, they got it. They got it, they picked up on it and they commented on it in a very positive light. So I think we got it. And there might be people who aren't happy. Um, I think that kind of just happens in life. And if they're going to take the time to not be happy, I'm grateful they picked up the book in the first place. But I really do think that that we did a that we did a good job. I haven't seen one review yet that's shown me otherwise. Right. Yeah, I was just thinking about that because uh, I walked past my wife's office and she's got a, uh, a YouTube playing like a nine-hour singing bowl sort of ambient sound. It's like, you know, just very sweet and gorgeous. And like, there's literally 1.7 thousand thumbs down. It's like, people, <laughs> you know. Look, look, if you don't like singing bowls, don't go to that. You're yeah. going to want to go there, right? So you don't. Like, what? Yeah. What's your hobby? I thumbs down YouTube videos, you know, keeps, I, keeps me busy. I think there are people that do that. But look, you know, I, I have actually, I'll pull this down. It's not very pretty, but for those people who aren't on YouTube, it says, I have this little sticky note that I keep in front of my desk. And it says, "This is this energy mind or someone else's? And what makes me feel lighter? So mm. when somebody does boo you or thumbs down you or leaves a nasty, leaves a nasty comment, you have no idea what's going on in their life, right? Like, did their dog die yesterday? Um, <clears throat> Did, did a friend hack into their account or go into their computer and just leave something to be silly? It, maybe they don't like children's books. Maybe they don't like singing bowls. So they don't like it. You don't know what's going on with them. And if you're happy in your spot, in your space, and you are attracting at least some people who are happy in your space too, that's what you've got to concentrate on. Mm. Is that part of what uh, the book teaches? 
Well, the book basically, I mean, on, on the first couple of pages, you see that they are feeling a little bit upset because their ice cream cone falls on the floor, their book gets torn, um, you know, the head falls off the doll or the tail falls off the elephant. And then they, they catch the eye or, or their eye is caught by the goldfish. And they're like, hmm, those goldfish are really peaceful. I wanna be peaceful just like them. So they take their big breath in together and then when they breathe out on the next page it's they become the goldfish and then it's just repetitive you know with with five six year olds everything's got to be repetition repetition do it again do it again so you know then the elephant catches their eye and they take a deep breath in and when they breathe out they're the elephants making their little trumpeting noise so it just it goes through like that it's just a repetition where they're getting inspiration from other objects around the house, the toys, the dandelion, they make the wishes fly up high. And then in the end, you know, they kind of, they come together in a little bit of a, in a little bit of a yoga pose with their hands at their heart and they're feeling a little bit better. Does it make, does it make everything go away? It doesn't make everything go away, but does it give us the opportunity to say, hmm, those things didn't work out for us. What's next? Can I be ready to draw again, even though my last paper ripped? And that's really the message that we're trying to get across is that when you're upset, you're upset in a moment and there's things to get you out of that moment. And there's tools that you can use and this breathing is, is a tool. So whether the child is feeling most connected to the dragon or the elephant or the goldfish or the pinwheel, when they're in the grocery store having a tantrum because the parents don't wanna buy them the Oreo cookies, then you know the parent can say, let's take some deep breaths like the dragon, take a deep breath in and you know slowly breathe out your, your brilliant fire. Uh huh. What that reminds me of actually is, I used to, I used to love watching uh, Cesar Milan, you know, the, the dog whisperer. Okay. You know, he would, he would, you know, he was like, he would come in and train people's incorrigible dogs and of course, he was never training the dog. He was training the owner, right? Yeah. So like, is this a stealth parents book? So secretly, yes. As a teacher, <laughs> I was, of course, you know, kindergarten teacher. I was, of course, of course, of course, teaching the children. But I was using the letters home and I was using the interviews to not just talk about the child, but to kind of give a little bit of, of parenting invite, advice in some ways as well, right? Or training, you know, when I'm training the child not to forget their little homework bag at home, it's the parent that needs to, to train the child to do that because the parent needs to have certain cues too. You can't expect a five-year-old to remember their homework bag every day. So yeah, there's a little bit of that too. And that's why I say zero to a hundred because whether it's the caretaker or the parent, you know, or a guardian or a school teacher, or educator, reading it to them, we need reminders too to, to connect with, with breath. We need reminders too to not just breathe the most shallow that we could breathe to stay alive. And you know, sometimes when you haven't done that for a while and you take that first deep breath, you almost stutter on it a little bit because your body's not, not used to it, but then you feel so much calmer. And I had the opportunity to read this book to a group of adults a few weeks ago. And I asked them to kind of connect with their body and see how stiff do your shoulders feel? How stiff does your neck feel? What does your head feel like? Give yourself a number out of 10 on how calm you kind of feel at it right now. And then I read them the book and then I asked them to reflect on that again. And they were all amazed that after I read them this, you know, three minute little book and we all took the deep breaths in and out together, how much calmer they felt and how all of that stress had kind of melted away. Hmm. Yes, yeah, it's... it's um... It's, it's easy to dismiss a simple children's book, right? And to dismiss something as simple as breathing. And yeah, I mean, what I, what I love about this is, you know, stress management is a very complicated topic and the physiology of stress and how to deal with it. And there's, you know, books and courses, but ultimately the breath is the most powerful tool, the cheapest, the most present and the most immediately effective. You know, I love how, how, how you simplified it to, to just that versus, versus how, how, how complicated we can make it. Yeah, and I think that kind of comes back to a lot of things in life. You know, someone might be feeling stressed and they might say, okay, I need to go for a massage. 
I need to take the time to book it. I need to take the time to drive there. I need to take the time to have the massage. Then I leave the massage, you know, drive home, have to shower, all of these things. Or, you know, I want to lose weight. Well, what, what tools can I use to lose weight? Should I sign up for this program or that program? Or maybe you can just change the things that you're eating on a regular basis and see how that goes first. Or, you know, do I need medication for my mental health? Don't I need medication for my mental health? Well, if you're not in an emergency state, do the things that are so simple first. See, give yourself enough time, as long as it's not an emergency, give yourself enough time to deal with those things first. And if they're not making an impact or enough of an impact, then start to look for some of those other tools. But if we don't start at the most natural level and we're just looking for things outside, then we kind of get ourselves in trouble because then we've got to remember you know, all the, all these other things and the stress never goes away. We're just putting band-aids on top mm -hmm. of everything. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, how, how you see this book, um, helping with, you know, you mentioned medication for mental health, the you know, astronomical rates of diagnosis and drugging of kids for ADHD. Do you, do you see a connection between your work and this book and, and that phenomenon? I, I definitely do. I mean, like, ADHD, there, there are 6 million kids that are diagnosed with depression or anxiety right now. Um, so that's a huge, that's a huge number. And if they're not taught these tools, then they have more of a chance of being diagnosed. They have more of a chance of going on medication. Not that the diagnosis is necessarily a bad thing, but it means that they've got to the point where they need to be diagnosed. And I think every situation that kind of comes up plays on top of each other, right? Like it, it, it builds up. So it's not just, okay, my, my dog died today and my grandma died six months later. They are, they become very intertwined. So if you had a harder time dealing with that dog, you're going to have a harder time dealing with that grandma as well. So, and, and the stressors don't have to be as big as that either, right? It could be a kid saying, I don't want to be your friend or a toy being broken or, or whatever it is. So if we have the tools to keep our to, to keep our stress levels down, to keep our heart rates down, to think through situations, think before we talk, think before we act, then that's practice for the next thing and the next thing too. So I think that that it'll definitely help. And when we talk about, you know, ADHD, there's a lot, there's a lot that plays in there. There's a lot that plays in there. I've seen many, many kids medicated. I've seen many, many kids use tools other than medication and get the same results, but it does take dedication. It takes dedication from the family. It takes dedication from the educators and it takes people working together. And that's part of why the reason I love like the happy, colorful pictures as well. And originally I had named it the Big Breath Book, but if I would have named it the Big Breath Book, <clears throat> It would have attracted people who were looking for breath techniques for children. But when it's called I'm a Peaceful Goldfish and it's so bright and colorful, it's going to attract anybody who wants a fun, cute little book for their children. And then they're going to get the message when they open it and when they read it too. So this definitely has the opportunity to impact other people who wouldn't have otherwise found breath to be able to work on that with their children. Now, this, this book comes out, um, I think, on, on, on two different trend waves. Uh, one of them is like breath work is really, really big now from, you know, the, the exposure of Wim Hof and this new, this book Breath by James Nestor has been making the rounds. Have you interacted with the, the sort of the professional breath work community or is there interest or is that affecting the the distribution or sales or, or um, reception of your book? So that's not one of the places that I went to at first when I was looking for um, collaboration and you know influence. That's not one of the places that I went, but it's definitely one of the places um, that I would that I would like to go. Um, I, I've you know it, it's it, there's so many different areas, right? Like there's there's the children world in general, right? And then there's the more mindfulness meditation kind of world. And then there's the yoga world. And then there's the breath world. 
Um, and I think part of the reason this book was, was born was also because I had taken that kids yoga class or a kids yoga course and gotten certified as a kids yoga instructor just a couple of months before. So it was the idea of yo like yoga in my head also and how do we teach kids that yoga is okay? And a lot of the yoga, the, the way that I was teaching yoga wasn't okay, everybody, warrior one, warrior two, like that's not the way we were doing it. We were acting like elephants. We were acting like dragons. We were acting like goldfish and we were doing actual yoga poses. But if, if it wasn't, if I didn't say the word yoga, somebody might walk in and just think that we were dancing or playing or using our imagination. So I, I guess I kind of like to expose people to things without them really knowing what's going on. They're, they're entering it because the energy feels good and then they can bring that forward. But the, the breathing world is definitely a place that I need to go with this. Mm. Mm. Um, and the other, the other wave of course is COVID. So I'm curious whether you started working on this book before you knew how important it was gonna to be to like everyone's daily lives. Yeah, so I get a lot of people saying to me like, wow, you really, you really saw a negative situation like COVID, um, like Black Life Matters, and you really were able to bring that to life and, and give people a tool to, to, to deal with that. And I was like, this book was born six years ago. It was, it was April or May of 2015, I believe, or, or yeah, 2015 that I had that first idea for the book. So I went through, you know, this book's just for my kid and how am I gonna use it with him? And then I used it in my yoga classes and then I need to publish it. And I had the illustrations made, which took a while. And then I said, hmm, I should try to find a publisher. So that took two years to find a publisher and then another two years, April to now that the book is actually out. So this has definitely been something in the making. I wish it would have been able to come out, you know, a year and a half or two years ago so that we would have had it at the beginning, but everything happens in the time that it happens. And I think there's more people looking for this as a tool right now than there would have been um, a year and a half ago. Yeah, sir. I mean, certainly, you know, kids have been isolated, but they've also been isolated with very cranky and under-resourced parents. Definitely. So I, I mean, my own children right now, next month, they're turning 13 and 11. So I know what it's like to have those preteens in the house right now. And some days are great. And some days I need to breathe a lot. <laughs> um, but for those, ch those parents who have children six years and under, seven years and under in the home where they can't make their own breakfast, or they, you know, they can't take a shower on their own and they need a little bit more attention and can't do their work on their own. You know, it, it's hard, it's hard for them. And I think parents need time to relax. Parents need to be kind to themselves and give themselves the opportunity to have some time without the kids, have some self-care time. If they do get a little bit out of, out of whack to, to say, it's okay that I did that because look at every other day where I didn't, um, you know, so, but, but the children themselves, what they must be going through, not being social, not because they need to be practicing their social skills right now. They need to be practicing getting into fights with people and how to get out of them because that's how they're going to be able to cope with it even more when they're, when they're older. So yeah, I, I do feel, I, I have a lot of sympathy for the parents of, of the kids who are less independent throughout mm. this whole thing. Right. So what, one of the challenges in writing about sort of stress management is, and I saw this a lot in the 90s, that there was a, there was a trend of, of turning stress management into um, you, you adapt to situations instead of trying to change them. Right, like, and you yeah. talked about, you know, Black Lives Matter, like there are, you know what I'm saying? Like there's a danger, I think, in telling children, okay, that sucked, now breathe. That sucked, now breathe. As opposed to like, there's, a, there's almost a form of disempowerment. How, did you think about that or deal with that or? No, because I'm not necessarily sending the message or I hope I'm not necessarily sending the message of 
okay, well, that was awful. Let's turn around and, and go to do something over here, right? Like what, like one of the things that happened in the beginning of the book, and it's not, it's not written about, it's implied through the illustration is that, you know, they were drawing and didn't like their drawing or the page broke or the crayon broke. And, you know, they take their deep, their deep breaths. And then in the end they go ready, ready. And you see that they're ready to go back to the draw <laughs> to the drawing board. They're ready to go back to the paper. So they're, they're trying again. They're, you know, um, I don't know, are they making lemonade out of lemons or, you know, but regardless, I think we've all learned that if we could step back from a situation for just a moment, when we get that email and we take a step back for a moment and we think about it, or we go and eat our lunch first and then come back to it, the way we're going to respond in that moment is going to be a lot different than the way we would have responded had we written that email right away, right? Some of the emotion dies away so we can make better choices. So it's really about, it's not saying that taking deep breath is going to fix everything, you know, we're always going to have adversity in our life, but it's how you, how you deal with it and how you cope with it and how you react to it is, is really one of the main things that I wanted to get across that it can seem a little bit better than what it is. Mm -hmm. so, so you said you have, you have 11 and 13 year old boys. I have my, my 13 year old boy and an 11 year old girl. Okay. okay. Yeah. So when I was a 13 year old boy, I, I had to go through a period of, of anything for kids was gross, <laughs> right? <laughs> Does your son like the book? So they, they like, like they're not staying up late reading it or, or anything <laughs> like that. Um, you know, they've been hearing about it and seeing it and I've been reading them the different versions over the last couple of years. They're almost desensitized <laughs> to it at this point, but I know that they're really proud and I know that they're, that they're happy and, you know, on, on the 13th, they're like, should we text all our friends' parents now and tell them that your book is finally, that you're finally, your book's finally available? So they're excited and they feel um, part of the process because I've been involved them in some of the decision making and, and getting their opinions and thoughts. Um, but, you know, they surprise you. Sometimes they like things that are very, like, you know, very babyish for them. And sometimes they're like, oh no, that's too babyish. So, um, I, I know that I, there are a couple of people who have messaged me and said, I showed your book to my teenagers just to say, look what my friend wrote and my teenagers asked, asked for a copy. Uh -huh. um, so I, I think, I mean, there is definitely being a kindergarten teacher and having read so many children's books over the years, there were ones that I enjoyed a lot and there were ones that I wanted to reread no, not that I was staying up late reading them myself, but I wanted to reread them to the to my kids or my students because I really did enjoy them. So kids sometimes put on an act too. Like, oh, they're too cool for this, mm. even though they kind of still like they watch Sesame Street, they just don't tell their friends they do. Uh-huh. <laughs> I still watch Sesame Street. <laughs> I, I go on YouTube to watch Sesame Street sometimes. Really? They have it in so many different languages and countries too, which is which I find interesting. <laughs> Um, do, do your kids like think about sharing the content with their friends when their friends get upset and freaked out and do they do it, you know, do they do it in a, and if so, do they do it in a, um, constructive way? So that's a good question. I don't know. Cause I'm not always there for it, but I know that they'll say to me, I know mom, I got to take breaths, right? Like, so they'll, they'll use it. They'll either use it or use it against me um, <laughs> in certain, in certain situations. But I mean, I know just from, you know, from the plant-based point of view, having them come home and say, why does so-and-so's mother send them to school with these products in their lunchbox don't they know it's gonna don't they know it's gonna hurt them I don't want my mm -hmm. friend to be to be hurt I don't want my friend having a heart attack when she's a mom or or dad or, or whatever it is um so I know I've seen that sympathize sympathy in them before in other ways I haven't yet seen it with this but I could only imagine that whether they're doing it now or not they will have some kind of influence on other people now or within five years, or maybe within 20 or 30 years, that this will somehow influence them because they've been exposed to it. So there's no, there's no way out of it. Mm -hmm. Right. 
So today's uh, the we're recording on April fifteenth. The book was published on April thirteenth. What's your what's your go to market strategy? How's how what's how are we going to dominate the world with this message? And, and and specifically, what can listeners to this podcast do to help spread the word? Yes, great. So part of part of the strategy is to kind of right now what I'm doing is I'm just. I like I created a huge launch. Um, I had so much going on. I'm pretty sure I slept 14 hours last night <laughs> because I'm <laughs> so tired from the day before. I'm like, oh, gotta go do my hair for, for for the show. But um, you know, I I think that right now I'm looking for what is the reaction, what is the feedback, and who are the people that I know who are gonna say, you know, I have people saying to me, the immigration services in Canada provide books and provide techniques and provide opportunity for new immigrants. And this would be great. Somebody who worked who worked in, in that field before. So I have a lot of different ideas being thrown at me. So the last couple of months have been, you know, how what's the launch? How do I get as many people knowing as possible? Because the better ratings of the book, the more hands it can get into, the more little hands and big hands it can get into mm -hmm. to start working. Um, come September, I'm going to be working with schools and starting to say for mindfulness days or author author days, there's different opportunities for me to come in physically or virtually all over the world now because of COVID, I can go in anywhere. So I'm, I'm going to be starting, I'm going to be starting there because I really like to make the connection between the school and the home. If the parents and the schools are using the same, the same um, vocabulary, and the same cues, then that will be even better for the students. So that's something that I'd like to create there as, as a first step. So anybody who has little kids, anybody who knows teachers, please let them know about the book and please let them know that I'm available for keynote speaking and coming in um, for author and mindfulness days there. And um, there's a couple of other things that I have that I have in mind that I'm gonna start building out. Um, but the getting to the people who have access to the children as much as possible. I also have a couple of, I'm going to be making some visits into some community, into some um, community centers for underprivileged children. Um, you know, that's definitely something that I want to be able to put some time and energy into as well, because the people who walk into Indigo or Barnes and Nobles in the States and, you know, see the book there, that's one thing But the people who don't have the luxury to, to necessarily spend $20, $17 on a book and walk in, how am I going to give them the opportunity to interact with the book as well? Mm. Are you uh, looking at different translations? It seems like it wouldn't be a big job because it's, it's such a such a concrete vocabulary of, you know, dragon, elephant. It's <laughs> like you, you wouldn't need, you know, a, a Nobel Prize winner <laughs> linguist to, uh, to, to translate. get that done. So that is, um, that's a process that that's a public that's a publisher question i think they're looking for proof of proof of concept here in in the english speaking countries um, so the more people can do to help to help um, you know help get the book into more hands then it's more proof of concept so that it can be translated into a lot of different languages and i'm looking forward to that as well and if anybody wants to turn it into a tv show let me know i think it would make a cute little you know, 20 minute spot on Saturday morning cartoons, if those even still exist. I don't know. Oh, you know what, you know who we should talk to? Um, do you know um, uh, uh, Michael and Bianca Alexander? I don't. Consci Conscious Living TV? No. Oh, they do, they do cool know. stuff. Yeah, I think it's consciousliving.tv. I've had them on a couple of times. Um, I'll, I'll connect you. Thank you, I appreciate um, that. You got any products? I mean, because you know, like we're we're in the world. Like you know, we do coaching and we create videos and things. Do you have uh, plans for online offerings, either either you know, bonus to the book or or courses and videos and audios? So um, I did have some I did have some bonuses for our for our community. Um, I I can I can send you a link for a kids yoga video. And that you could put that in the show notes for oh, parents cool. to do it with their children. They can do it with if they're teachers. They could do it in their classrooms. So just an opportunity to be exposed to 
I don't even consider it alternative lifestyle at this point. Like yoga is not really alternative anymore. I, th I think I think it's just alternative in Alabama. We, uh, yeah. Yes. I think it's I think it's still illegal there. <laughs> you know what? It's it's true. I was talking to. Um, are you familiar with um, Jeremy Gray? No. Jeremy Gray, he's he's starting a, a community center down there and they they grow all their own vegetables and um, um, Victoria Moran introduced me to him. So, you know, big vegan yogi, but he's also into politics. And he was telling me, and I'm, I'm gonna have him on the Plant Changes podcast to talk about how he's trying to make yoga legal in schools. And it's just beyond, I mean, for someone who's been hired for years to go into schools and I just, I set up in the library and everybody comes through the library every half an hour, it changes, it changes, it changes. I'm like, how can you not? Like, how can you not just, and like, it's yoga, it's not like, it's not, um, it's fun, it's exciting. It's well, maybe, maybe you could go down and teach them how to never say the word yoga. <laughs> and just like we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do pretend you're an elephant well that's and like i said when people would walk into my yoga classes they wouldn't necessarily know that it was a yoga class unless they knew they knew yoga and one of the things that i did and and i guess i guess i'm like that i guess that's kind of what the book is showing is that the book looks beautiful to every i hope it looks beautiful and, and exciting to everyone whether they're into breath work or not but at the end of my yoga class with my kids, I would never say namaste because there's a lot there. People don't realize that namaste is not a religious greeting, right? People might think it, it's religious. So instead of saying namaste, I would always say peace, love, and have a nice day. Cause to me, to me, it kind of, it kind of rhymes. Um, and we still, you know, put the heart, the hands to the heart. To me, that's a sign of gratitude, right? Um, so I would make things as accessible to everyone as possible. There were two children that I once had that weren't able to dance. They were of a certain age um, from a specific culture and dancing wasn't allowed. So they didn't take part. There was a lot of music. Had I known that in, in advance going in forward in those two particular classes, I wouldn't have even used music. I would have just made it all imagination, right? Um, so I try to be as inclusive as possible in everything that I do, yeah. Gotcha. Um, here's my, my last question. I, I've often had this experience where I've read a children's book that was good or, you know, and I'm like, it sold a billion copies. And I'm like, I, that seems easy. I could do that. And then I would start to try to write a children's book and it was impossible. Like, like the tone was just either over their heads or, or talking down to them. Did you have to like learn how to write to, for children? 15 years teaching kindergarten. And I was always the teacher that made things simple enough for them to understand, but never talked to them like they were toddlers. Um, you know, like the, I, I, I learned that happy medium. So I think that I just lived so much of that, that life. You know, you still want to get all the words, all the words right. Um, but at the same time, the, the, the tone worked for me because I was, I had experience with that. But like I said, when I first wrote that first page back in, in university, that was hard. It was like too many words on a page, too wordy, not enough words. You know, this vocab, you have to use five words to, to say one word because you don't want to use the big vocabulary. Well, is there something in between? So, so it's definitely not as easy as it seems. And I think sometimes when you're writing a book that has, you know, like, two million words in it, you don't need to pay as close attention to every single word. You know, it, it's an overall theme, it's an overall everything, but like we went back and forth between, is it bright fire or brilliant fire? Or like mm. how long it took us to go back and forth between some of those words. Um, how many words in the book? I keep meaning to check. I keep meaning to check, but um, maybe I should check. It just seems like there are other things I need to do that are a little bit more, more, um, more important, like sleep or spend time with my kids. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, no, don't, don't spend, don't spend time answering it for me. Like 10, 11, 12. I mean, maybe there's 12, 12 times 30, whatever that is, like some, oh. somewhere around there. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like I could write that many words in like 15 minutes and yet to get them right could take years. 
Exactly, exactly. So yeah, so 300 words. Um, yeah, can took took two years. It took like from the time I started with the publisher till now, it, it's been two years of going back and forth. But um, I mean, I've also been writing my adult book for a really long time or not writing my adult book for a really long time, which is oh, part of the reason why it never comes out. <laughs> what, what book is that? So Adam and I have been have been kind of writing, um, you know, his his journey, his story from we've been writing it from each of our perspectives for a long time. And, you know, not kind of knowing how, like, you know, is it just the story or is it the story with instruction and is it how to function as a family? There's there's a lot of unknown questions, but a lot of things that have come up over the last couple of years that have kind of put it on the back burner. Gotcha. Like maybe you'll push us to get that done. Oh, do you want me to? Uh, I don't know. Ask Adam. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So awesome. So um, the book is I Am a Peaceful Goldfish. People can find it wherever books are sold. It's available, I guess, on Kindle as well. Yes, there's a Kindle version, um, which is great for iPads. You know, some some people definitely like to touch and feel their books, but it's great for it's great for iPads. It's great for classrooms. In that way, anywhere books are sold online, in store. And um, if anybody did want a signed copy, we have that on the Plant Trainers Podcast website. We have signed copies as well. Okay, so, say, say that again a little slower and give us the URL. Sure. So it's Plant Trainers. There's two T's in the middle there. PlantTrainers.com. If you head over to the shop there, then you can find signed copies as well. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Shoshana, congratulations. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much. On, on birthing this book. <laughs> and uh, so, every, you know, everyone listening, go, go get a copy, give them as gifts, and let's, uh, let's spread the message of um, mindful, peaceful breathing. Yes, thank you. It does make a really great gift. So any, you know, any baby showers, not that we're having showers these days, but, you know, any, any, any baby gift um, or any child's birthday gift, it, it's definitely great. And if anybody wants to tag us at Plant Trainers on Instagram with their pictures of their children reading it, we're happy to restory that for you guys. Awesome. All right. Well, Shoshana, thank you so much for all you do. Say hi to Adam. Uh, I will. I will. Thank you for having me and helping me spread this amazing, um, this amazing message that, you know, stress doesn't have to feel as stressful as it, as it does sometimes. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Thanks again and take care.